Okay, I'd like to uh, call this meeting of the Select Board to order uh, May 7th, 2024, at 5 o'clock. Um, first thing is any additions and deletions? Comments? Um, other than the aqueduct. Nothing? Okay, so we will start the public forum. And Eric, words. Yeah, I just want to start us off. Uh, so first, I want to thank everyone for coming tonight. Uh, we appreciate uh, all the attendance and participation. Um, uh, this forum is kind of for the public to get a sense of what the site board has done since the last public forum. Uh, we're going to turn it over to Charlie Kimball in a second. Um, just two notes. One is we have a hard stop at 620. So we'll go up till 620. Then if we still have conversations, we have to stop at that point. Uh, for the annual uh, monthly trustees report. Um, the second, um, the conversation tonight uh, is not going to revolve around uh, the cost of the aqueduct acquisition or who will pay for it. Those conversations will come later. Uh, this public forum is set up more for a conversation of financials of the aqueduct and the infrastructure of the aqueduct, and that's what we're going to focus on tonight. Uh, so to make sure that's clear so everyone kind of is on the same page as we go forward. Uh, but with that, I'll turn it over to Charlie Kimball, who has graciously offered to moderate this public forum once again. Well, thank you, Eric, and thank you to the select board for allowing me to participate in this way. Uh, I was here at the last forum that we had, and that was also a nice day outside. So yeah. thank you for coming back on another beautiful day. Um, so we've got a PowerPoint presentation prepared and to introduce different speakers that are going to be here. Um, a few housekeeping notes. One, this is being recorded. Uh, so anything you say is going to be a matter of public record. Um, the second is it's a hybrid meeting. You'll see there are now, what, 15 people that are participating by Zoom. So we're going to try to manage it according to who's on Zoom and who's here. So when we get to questions, we're going to have to recognize who has a question on Zoom, who has a question here. We're going to try to limit questions at the end, to the end, and then go for three minutes apiece. I know people have a lot to say, um, but if you have a question or a comment, please try to limit it to that three minutes. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to hear from three different experts, but first let's get into the, let's go to the next. Yeah. Go oh, the sign-up sheet. Yes. Uh, two more things about, uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. So please sign up. Uh, who has that sign-up sheet? There we go. All right. And there are bathrooms that are located out in the hallway. All those on Zoom, I'm sure you know where the bathrooms are, wherever you are. Uh, so make sure you just avail yourself of them. Uh, okay. So is there anything else we need to uh, cover? Nope, okay. So let's jump right into it. So uh, why are we here? Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. So the purpose of the meeting is really for the select board to share with you the information they have gone through to determine whether or not it makes sense for the town to purchase the Woodstock Aqueduct Company. So part of that is looking at the financials, part of it's looking at the engineering reports, uh, there's also other information the select board has looked at, so they want to share that information with you so that there's no secrets, you know exactly what's going on, all right? So that's the idea. And then you have an opportunity to ask questions before this comes before a vote, um, which will be later if the select board moves to that uh, part, uh, later in the summer or in the fall, or that's a date yet to be determined. So let's go next one. Okay. So how did we get here? Uh, remember, the Woodstock Aqueduct, Aqueduct Company is a private entity that was formed in 1880, started servicing the town with water in 1887. Uh, they've been running the Aqueduct Company since then. It's uh, the Billings family is the ones who provided the upfront capital and has been managing that project since with other managers as well. So it's a private company that is owned by a number of shareholders. I think 34 is the last count. Could be 35, I don't know. So then in 2013, uh, the Vermont water supply rules deficiency were pointed out saying you don't even have enough water pressure. And I think there are some former employees here that might be able to comment on it, but there was a 2000, in 2017, there was a major capital project for the West End Loop. And that was to connect water coming down from, uh, uh, to go over onto Carlton Hill and uh, College Hill to provide enough water pressure to satisfy the deficiencies on that side of the river. Okay, that was done in 2017. 
In 2023, the thing that brought us together last August were the rain events. It wasn't really a flood, it was a rain event. Uh, but it disrupted water uh, to the town for 10 days and blew two of the river crossings apart, one down by Billings Farm down towards the sewer plant and the other at Elm Street Bridge. So, and then we had the public forum in August and that was the Woodstock Aqueduct Company really presenting information to interested people about what's going on. You know, what were they doing to repair and then what were the challenges facing the Woodstock Aqueduct Company going forward? And at that time, uh, Jira Billings, the president of the Woodstock Aqueduct Company said, you know, we'd be interested in selling this to the town uh, for a reasonable price. So then in the Harvard Business School, a uh, group of students from the Harvard Business School, I guess we'd call them a project team was engaged. And they spent about three months really diving into the details of the operating of water system. What are the uh, costs of financing? And they made a presentation in November of 2023 to the select board. Uh, the Woodstock Water Working Group was formed in about September, October. And we met on a weekly basis. There was six of us. Uh, and then we delivered a report to the select board in December and then made a presentation to the uh, finance committee, the Woodstock finance committee, as well as the Woodstock select board, uh, recommending that the town move to acquire the water company. Uh, the select board entered into this letter of intent, which is not a commitment at that point. It is we need to investigate the advantages of purchasing the aqueduct company and possibly moving towards an acquisition. Right, I think I captured that right. Okay, um, so that was in February of 2024. And since then they've been reviewing information to uh, whether to justify the purchase or not. And then the Woodstock Aqueduct Company, as you know, on April 2nd filed for a rate increase to pay for the improvements that they're forced to make in case the town does not purchase the Aqueduct Company uh, from the Aqueduct Company. All right, so they did make that rate application on April 2nd. And the public hearing I had May 20th up there, but May 22nd, anybody know? Anybody know? Okay, May 22nd, let's go with that date. Okay. All right, so here are the main concerns that the select board has been trying to address and that is of concern. Um, you know, who has control over the water security for the people on the system and for the town? Who has control? Um, public safety, is there enough water pressure to put out fires that might come along the, uh, from the hydrants and right now that that's a concern uh, and if you talk to the fire chief you'll find that out as well uh, can the staff of the town manage the public water system as it's constituted now uh, is the water system aligned with what the priorities are for the town plan you want to make sure any successive ownership also is aligned with what you want to get done in the town and then the affordability for ratepayers and taxpayers. The big question of who pays is not what we're going to talk about tonight. We don't have the answers to those questions. But that is, is it going to be affordable for the ratepayers? Is it going to be affordable to the taxpayers if it's owned by somebody other than the town or it's owned by the town or stays in current ownership? And then the last one is economic development. Thinking about how does the current water system impact economic development, the inability to service new developments uh, or existing housing or existing developments. Okay. So with that, we're gonna hear from three speakers. Yes, maybe four. All right, so the first Gallagher Flynn and Company is a CPA firm out of Burlington. They are engaged to uh, review the financials of the Woodstock Aqueduct Company. A uh, respected firm, probably the largest CPA firm in Vermont, um, and they, Tim Alb, 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 Obi, Tim. All right, Obi, anyway. Obi. Obi. Tim Obi uh, is going to be here to talk about it. He's uh, meeting with us by Zoom, and then Craig Jewett is here from MSK Engineering. Uh, you might remember Craig from a previous meeting, uh, and then also uh, William Nickerson. Uh, who you might recognize the last name. He has a father living in town uh, from uh, the, the state of Vermont, the Agency of Natural Resources. So um, he'll be with us also by Zoom uh, for issues of the, and then Eric Duffy, who I'm sure all of you know, if you don't know, please meet Eric, uh, who's been doing yeoman's work on this project. So with that, we're, that seems like the order that we're gonna go in, they're gonna make a presentation, each person, and at the end of it, then we'll take questions and comments. All right, sound all right? Okay, sound okay, right? Yep, all right. Okay, say Tim, 
Are you with us still? I am. All right. Tim, if you could explain for the people here and people on Zoom, what is the engagement like? I mean, what was Gallagher, Flynn and Company charged with? How does that compare to what you've done for other communities? And what were the results? Yep. Um, yep. Um, so uh, Tim Obi, uh, I'm the managing director of the transaction advisory services practice at Gallagher Flynn out of South Burlington. Um, and this is our, my team's kind of core work, works on mergers and acquisitions and helping companies do financial due diligence. Um, so what we were engaged to do was to kind of review the historical financials. We looked at 22 and 23 of the aqueduct, um, really just looking at what's their financial position. Do we understand kind of how the financial operations of the company work? And um, generally just looking for any red flags that would pop up um, as it relates to kind of the financials. Um, so my team, and we don't focus just or specialize just in municipalities. We primarily do kind of private corporate um, M&A deals. Um, but again, it's just analyzing a business and looking at their financials and understanding kind of what the risks are um, and, and what they tell us. Okay, so from there, can you give us a general overview of, of what you did find? Yep. Um, so effectively, what we were seeing in, in our process was we got the financial information um, directly from the company, had full access to Gyra, um, and kind of just had multiple conversations as we looked at the details. Um, effectively, what we're seeing is it's kind of a break even or a business that is kind of losing money when you kind of factor in kind of debt service and cash outflow on at least the 22, 23 periods that we're seeing. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing to note is just there's operating cash flow constraints of the company. Um, the rates of the company hadn't been increased since 2015. Obviously, there's a proposed rate increase now. Um, but with, with that rate increase kind of being deferred over the years and costs kind of just continue to rise, um, there really doesn't leave any excess cash to kind of um, plan for the future or do more proactive maintenance. It's really on a reactive basis. And when a reaction needs to happen, they appear to need to scramble to kind of find debt financing and some way to fund it. Um, so what we're seeing is there's about $800,000 of debt on the balance sheet. Um, you can see in 23 with the flood events, there was emergency repairs needed. They needed to take out a line of credit to be able to fund that temporary fix. And then there's a larger project coming up for a permanent fix of about 600,000 that still has yet to be funded from my understanding. And the company really just doesn't have any cash flow to even one funded from operations. But if you're a bank, you're probably also not gonna lend the company any money because they don't have enough cash flow to kind of service that debt going forward. Um, so those would be kind of the big watch outs or kind of the, the concerns. On a standalone basis, the company just doesn't generate enough cash flow to really sustainably um, invest in infrastructure and kind of make proactive repairs, just a normal course of business. Um, then obviously there's the large, and we'll hear about it, of the engineering report of some large capital expenditures that are required to kind of meet the state requirements um, and efficiencies in the system. Um, that's a different thing. The company itself right now just really can't fund, doesn't have any access to kind of even fund proactive just maintenance and improvement. Um, so that's kind of the big takeaways from it. Um, they do have a few capital expenditures coming up. Uh, the SCADA system, I think, was about $40,000 that is sunsetting and ne they need to replace in 24. Um, and then also that $600 plus thousand dollar permanent fix for the Elm Street um, bridge line. Um, of that, I think 180000 received in grant funds. 
Um, so they, but they need to fund the rest of it. Those are kind of like the immediate, just normal course kind of concerns. And then there's the bigger capital improvements needed. Um, another thing just that we were asked to look at was just any red flags in kind of excess compensation or excess distributions or anything like that to shareholders or, or management. And really, we didn't see any evidence of any excess um, being paid to, to anyone. Um, the only kind of cash leaving the business is amounts paid to Jaira and his brother Frank for operating the business. They both take a very modest salary of, I think, combined 60,000 together. Jaira is the primary operator of the company. Um, and then his brother is, is the backup and also serves some, like an administrative role. Um, but combined, they're looking at $60,000 together, um, which in my, I didn't do a compensation study or anything, but I mean, that just seems like a modest salary to be taking, to be running kind of the, the operations of a company. Um, I think he had noted the, it, when he and his brother retire, the intent would be they'd have to hire on a full-time person to kind of run the business. And that might be $125,000. Um, so that's kind of the comparable of they're probably taking an under market rate. Um, outside of those payments, um, there's a, a nominal amount of rent paid to Jira's entity um, as they lease office space from his other business. Um, but again, that's like thousand dollars a month. Um, so it's not excessive. It would be in line with market rate to record or to rent an office space. Um, so really that's it um, from kind of the shareholder type cash out. Um, we looked at bank statements so we can kind of confirm the cash that came in and cash came out, reconciled that against the financial statements. So we're pretty confident that the cash that we're seeing is all reflected in the financial statements that we were looking at. We looked at payroll registers, kind of tied those out to the financial statements. So we have a good feel on kind of the ins and the outs of the cash um, that we don't think there's anything out there that is kind of outside of the scope of the information we were given. Um, so with that said, I mean, for a business to operate, uh, a normal business, um, you would expect to be seeing a lot more, you'd, you'd want to see a lot more cash coming down to the bottom line on your PL so that you're able to build up a capital reserve fund or have a more proactive maintenance infrastructure improvement plan process rather than always trying to react and find the funds when things pop up. But right now under the kind of current structure with the rates that haven't been updated since 2015 um, and the, the expenses just around the business, um, it just doesn't generate uh, sufficient cash flow to really kind of sustain itself and improve itself uh, to any notable degree. Great, right, Sam. Is there, hopefully, that's helpful. That, that's, that's very good. good. Is there it's anything great. else you want to add before we uh, uh, we go on to the next speaker? Because we'll have questions for you at the end. Is that all right? Uh, that's fine. I think that's a good overview from my end, and then we can fill in the holes with. As questions pop up on what people are curious about, we certainly looked at a good amount of info. Um, so happy to get questions at the end. Terrific, thank you. Thank you. And for and those of you that came late, either in person or online, um, so we have two more speakers. We're going to hear from them, and then we're gonna take questions after that. Uh, the bathrooms are in the hallway. Or they're in your house somewhere. Okay. So thank you, Tim. And next we're gonna have Craig Jewett from MSK Engineering. Um, and Tim is here, uh, what's your name? Craig, Craig uh, is here to tell us about the preliminary engineering report, which was completed and approved, I think, in December, is that right? Yes. December, and uh, that information, the whole engineering report, will be made available on the town website. So Craig? I'm just going to stand up so no one has to look at the back of my head while I talk. Um, so my name is Craig Jewett with MSK Engineer. Um, we were hired by the aqueduct. Uh, you need to hold this. Sorry. Sorry. Can everybody hear me okay now? Yeah. Um, so we were hired by the aqueduct to perform a preliminary engineering study of the water system specific to the hydraulic conditions during fire flow events. 
uh, the, the concern from DEC is that the hydraulic conditions in the water system during a uh, fire event are substandard and could cause potential contamination issues in the water system. So while there is information about the water system as a whole, uh, the document is not an overview or a broad look at the water system as a whole. It's specific to hydraulic conditions during fire flow events. Um, so we reviewed uh, the system, performed um, some fire flow uh, testing, uh, flowed some hydrants to get some data related to that, and reviewed the hydraulic conditions of the water system. Um, just to give a little bit of background, uh, wells are over on this side of town as you head out uh, on uh, Route 12. Storage tank is on the opposite side of town, up Cox District Road, uh, as you go up uh, Cox District Road. So uh, sources on one side of the system, well, or uh, tank on the other. The sources pump directly into the water system uh, while also serving the water storage tank. So the tank floats on the system and the sources meet the demand on the system with the help of the tank. Under normal operation, a water system would ideally pump to a tank and that tank would then meet the demand of the system and not rely on the sources to be pumping to help meet that demand. Um, so when we reviewed the system, we reviewed it under two conditions with the well pumps on and with the well pumps off. Uh, because it does change some of the hydraulic conditions of the system. And at night, typically the wells are not running. So we wanted to look at both of those uh, conditions. And so we reviewed uh, the system, did a hydraulic model, uh, and reviewed it uh, versus the minimum requirements in the water supply rule, but also uh, recommendations of the insurance companies related to typical fire flows that they would want to see for the types of densities that the town has. Um, that number is around 3,000 gallons per minute in the village. Um, the minimum standard for the state is 500 gallons a minute. So kind of completely different fire flow scenarios. Obviously, when the fire department cranks on to a hydrant, they want to get as much water as they can, regardless of where they, where they are. What the report identified is that indeed there is a hydraulic condition that could cause contamination under certain scenarios or enough so that it is concerning and it doesn't meet minimum standards that during a fire flow, the system cannot maintain a minimum of 20 pounds of pressure throughout the distribution system. And essentially what they're trying to prevent is a vacuum condition where the person who's at the highest part of the system will have the lowest pressure when a fire condition happens, that individual is the first person who's gonna receive that low pressure. And do you create a vacuum where now potentially something gets sucked into the water system? We think about uh, fuel tanks and, and stuff of that, uh, hot water heaters, that sort of stuff. Um, we've come a long way since then, but that's in general kind of the concern is that you're depressurizing the system and you're opening up the distribution system for potential contaminants to intrude into the water system. So once that was identified and confirmed, what we then turned and looked to do was what are the alternatives that would help address this issue? Um, and so we looked at a couple of different options. One was replacing the, uh, replacing the transmission main from Cox District Road down to Route 4 and continuing that uh, change in transmission line along Route 4 uh, until you get to the bridge. That was looked at as one option to upsize the line. Another option was to look at tank sightings for a new tank to be built on the system. Uh, the tank that exists on the system right now is, uh, is on the older side of things, may, will need to be replaced at some point in time. So can we kill two birds with one stone, find a tank site that fixes the issue? And if it happens to replace the other tank or we can do something different with it in the future, there's more options available. So the report identified four sites that met the hydraulic conditions necessary to solve the problem. So there were four landowners who were identified strictly based on topography, the height of the tank and what that pressure will provide for the system. 
there were four spots that were looked at. They we did not speak to any landowners related to this. So there's there's been no engagement with the landowners related to this. But essentially, we identified four potential locations where a tank could be sited, and if it was sited in those locations, would address the hydraulic conditions um, in the system down to maybe a handful of hydrants. So right now, I think there's 96 hydrants on the system total. Um, we would potentially, with, with what I would call the lowest of the tank sites available or the lowest potential tank sites, that would get us down to a handful of hydrants that would still be deficient. Um, and then there are certain tank sites that would uh, make the whole system whole uh, as far as from the hydraulic concerns that exist. Um, within the report and the study, there were things that were brought up uh, by the state. Um, one of which is the fact that the majority of the distribution system is 100 plus years old. Um, and when and if more hydrant flow is available, we're moving more water through those lines, you're increasing the velocity, there is a potential that you're going to break more mains, you're going to break more things. So while the tank solves the hydraulic issue, it should not be viewed by anybody to say, well, that's good, we did a good job, we can walk away. There are future things that need to be considered related to the water system. Those are more long range planning discussions. That's not what's in the report. The report is specific to what immediately fixes the concern that the state has. The long term and long range discussions are something different. And when you do get the report or you get the opportunity to look at the report, I apologize that any of you had to actually read that. Uh, just from the standpoint of it's 40 some odd pages of text and it's it's not really, it, it's bedtime reading, truth be told. Um, there's two tables at the end, table 40 and table 41. And the reason that I think those are uh, an important takeaway related to that is they give you two uh, financing scenarios for the alternative. One is if the town owns it and they have the ability to access 2% loans from the state of Vermont. The other scenario is assuming fair market interest rates right now, assuming that the aqueduct could actually get those rates from a bank, which Gallagher Flynn has indicated may be a difficult hill for them to climb. At 7% versus 2%, the cost to the users doubles. So it's just an important takeaway to say that some of this discussion is some of the things that with the town's ownership of this, you will have more opportunity to access financing that is much more advantageous to the end users. So numbers are the numbers. I will answer any questions that I can from a technical standpoint. I think that's the bigger takeaway is to say the aqueduct does not have access to money that the town would have access to at a much more favorable rate and with inflation where it is, it's a lot better than it was even two or three years ago. Um, so hopefully uh, I've given you guys a baseline. If there's any questions, happy to answer any questions. Kirk, before we move on. There are there are three reservoirs that used to feed the water system, Cox District, Bondell Reservoir, and also Carlton Hill. They do not, they're not connected to the water system right now providing water. Is that correct? That is correct. So, and then if that was necessary as a backup water supply, what would have to happen? So, if we were to have a scenario where we were looking at the reservoirs as a source for the water system, um, the state of Vermont does not allow emergency sources. You would have to permit that source as a fully compliant public water source through the state of Vermont. So there would be certain um, certain standards that we would have to meet related to that. There would be certain set of treatment that we need would need to provide, but that is permitted throughout the state. There are many state uh, municipalities that have surface water systems. My comment related to that would be is don't give up any opportunities that you have for a potential source because you never know. Um, where you're going to end up. Uh, I just finished a study this last year for the village of Newbury. They spent a bunch of money 15 years ago getting off of their reservoir, had some other sources. Those sources have since dried up. We had to go back through the process of getting the reservoir reconnected 
to the system as a source. So um, those are sources. They're not high quality sources. There are hoops that would need to be jumped through, but with climate change being what it is and droughts seemingly becoming more and more prevalent, having that as an opportunity or an option to you down the road, there is value uh, to those assets, even though they're not currently connected to the water system. Great, thank you. That's Craig Jewett from MSK Engineering. He's gonna be back with us to answer questions, more specific questions you have. And next on the hit parade, is uh, William Nickerson. William, are you with us? I am here. Can you hear me? Yes. So on. Yeah, so William, well, just state, what, what do you do? I am an engineer for the, um, the Department of Environmental Conservation, Drinking Water and Groundwater Protection Division. Um, and in my group of engineers, we review um, reports like Craig created, created uh, preliminary engineering reports. We permit improvements to public drinking water systems. So any water main replacement, water main extension, storage tank construction, well, well or other source connection and treatment. We review design drawings and issue permits to allow the, those uh, plans to be constructed. Um, we also uh, work with our funding agency, which is called the Water Investment Division. It's another division in DEC, and they administer um, funding through EPA's Drinking Water State Revolving Fund. And we provide um, we provide um, engineering service agreement, technical overview, so scopes when a when a public water system that's receiving funding through that source contracts with a with an engineer, we review the scope and provide approval on the, the technical aspects of the scope. Um, so and then we also provide technical assistance directly to water systems. So uh, we'll help investigate um, issues with source water quality or problems that are happening with treatment or other issues that might be occurring in the distribution system. We work <clears throat> the drinking water groundwater protection division has other sections that my engineering team works with closely. There's an operations section that completes sanitary surveys of all the public water systems. There's a compliance section that reviews all of the monitoring data that is taken in the water, in, in the water system um, and make sure that <clears throat> the water quality is staying in compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Vermont um, water supply rule. And also that Customers are notified whenever the law says they need to be notified. For instance, if there is a water main depressurization, as Craig was talking about, then a, a boil water notice would need to be issued. And our compliance group makes sure that those are issued, and uh, as well as all the other water quality monitoring that occurs. Um, but it, my group specifically works mostly with engineering consultants like Craig and water system owners like uh, a fire district board or a town a municipal town board um, or a private owner um, to figure out how the different technical alternatives for addressing some deficiency or uh, improvement plan can meet the water supply rule. So, and you reviewed the report from Otter Creek Engineering uh, and then your department is in char charge of kind of giving it its blessing as to, uh, right, in terms of this is technically and factually correct. The recommendations are sound. So can you tell us what your review then resulted in? So in, in our group, um, this preliminary engineering report was reviewed by Allison Murphy, who's one of our engineers. Um, and we review it, we review preliminary engineering, engineering reports um, with kind of two references, the water supply rule and all of the design standards, water quality requirements um, and operational requirements that are included in the rule. And then we also review it against a, um, a planning report format, which is a, it's a, 
a format and a guidance that's published by USDA Rural Development. And that ensures that the planning reports include all of the um, elements that are necessary to make an engineering decision. Um, there's a need statement, there's a description of the existing facilities, there's a section where you talk about the feasible alternatives that can address the need, and then there's a, a life cycle cost analysis, and then a, a section where you compare the costs and other factors, non-monetary factors, and decide, You ideally you would decide what um, solution you wanna choose as a result or, or what project you might wanna move forward with. So we use those two references to review these. Um, and our approval is primarily saying that the format, everything that's discussed, the format is followed, the, the main format that, that includes all of the important um, evaluation components. And then also that the recommended alternatives meet the water supply rule. So in, in your opinion, then the the MSK, I'm sorry, the Otter Creek Engineering Report does do that for the select board's benefit. I mean, so it's not like it has to be reviewed then by another engineering firm. Is that correct? Um, yes. According to Allison's review, this report meets those those two standards that we use. It meets the, the recommended alternative, meets the water supply rule. Um, and follows the the correct format and includes the components that it needs to include. Did you find anything in your review that uh, is more than what was recommended by Otter Creek Engineering? So Allison um, issued a letter uh, along with our approval. It's kind of like a document we use to um, come back to the project. So when a when a project moves along to its next stage of life, which is ideally a, a some improvement, we it usually takes a few years. So we try and document what we think is important um, to remember about the about what was said in the PER, and also what it, additional work might be useful to pursue. Um, so we have a searchable database where all of our well, the majority of our records, water system related records can be searched by the water system ID number. Um, and that with a letter can be found there. And I was gonna drop the, the address for that in the chat. I don't know how, if anybody can see it, but um, you can- That's getting fancy for us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, if you find it online, you can search the water system ID, which is, um, VT0000543. Uh, but this letter um, basically says that it, in order to, the recommended alternative would be a storage tank, is basically what Craig just described to address the hydraulic deficiencies. There would be, need to be additional cost analysis once an actual property was found to be feasible. Um, so the, the report kind of says, the recommended alternative meets the water supply rule, but this this main part about actually locating a place that it can go still needs to be done. Um, and then there's a bunch of other comments in here that are just for further consideration. As Craig said, there's um, it's like something like over half of the water system is beyond its useful life, um, and that all of the hydrants are deficient. So there's there, Allison's just kind of summarized the highlights uh, for what will be relevant to the division staff who will be working with the water system. Okay. Before we uh, then close it out and we go to Eric Duffy, is there anything else that we should hear from you, uh, William? Um, I don't. I don't. I don't have a summarized what the Drinking Water Groundwater Protection Division does, but if you're interested in drinking water, um, you can always reach out to us. And um, we have a lot of really knowledgeable, excellent staff who are, are, are always willing to talk about what we do. Great, okay, thank you very much. And uh, we'll tell your father you said hello. Thank you. Um,
And then with that, we'll go to Eric, Eric Duffy. Yeah, I don't have much. Uh, the select board has um, agreed to open up negotiations with the aqueduct over our potential acquisition costs. And those conversations are ongoing and those stay confidential until which point the select board feels comfortable going forward with going, going public with them. That was quick. <laughs> We're at time limits. Actually, at least five minutes. Um, all right. So, anything from the select board before we open it up to questions? Do you want of our panel? No, I don't. Have no. I, I have some questions for Craig, if that's okay. Absolutely. You mind if I okay. And Craig, because uh, I have a microphone up. Yeah. And because even though everyone should know the select board members, you may not. Uh, and even though you may not, you may know somebody in the audience. Not everybody does. So please introduce yourself when you have a question you're going to ask. Hi, Craig, Laura, Powell. Um, thank you, Jill. Um, I was wondering, um, this is kind of separate from the evaluation you did, but um, I know a lot of people in the community have emailed me about the new EPA thresholds for PFAs and what that could mean for our acquisition of, of the company if that's something that it should be of a concern and would necessitate further capital spending on our part to meet those permitting requirements. So um, good, good question. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm not aware that the water system has tested positive for any PFOS. Uh, I do believe they've been required to sample um, and Depending on how the MCL gets rolled out in the state, now that EPA has made this determination, they may require more sampling to be done. Uh, but there is no identified issue related to PFOS in the source or anywhere in the distribution system that I'm aware of. Specific to, um, oh, and yeah, these results are all, yep, all negative. Um, I will say, though, as a long range or a long, uh, long-term considerations that's why the reservoir should be looked at as an asset and a liability at the same time to say that if there were to be an issue related to PFOS in the future mm -hmm. typically having an alternative source is the cheapest way to go about solving that problem awesome thank you um I I'll also follow. yeah I wanted to ask about something separately sure. which is that um I think per state law, the water company has to publish their lead line inventories this October. Yes. And I was wondering if through the course of your investigation, like you've seen those inventories or if those would be made available to the town, like in the process of negotiation. Uh, sorry. Um, so the question was related to the, the service line inventories at all public water systems in the, in the country. Uh, need to um, complete by the middle of October of this year. Um, so it is a requirement that it be shared with the public. I believe that requirement is once it's been submitted to DEC. Okay. Um, I have not been involved with that, but I know the Aqueduct Company is actively moving through that. Um, and what I think you will find, so let me step back for a second there are going to be a lot of what is called unknown. And with those unknowns, EPA says you have to assume the worst and then work your way out of that. So that will be something that needs to be looked at and reviewed once that inventory is developed. And there will be subsequent phases that the state will be doing with their state contracts related to sampling and those sorts of things related to that. Um, I will state that that's an interesting topic because if the town owns the water system in that next phase, they are eligible for money that they weren't eligible in this first round because it was owned by the aqueduct. Awesome, thank you. And then last question. Um, I think per the preliminary engineering report from the fall, the water tank was due to be inspected this month and I'm wondering if that has happened. I have not followed up with the aqueduct company about whether that inspection has occurred yet, um, but I could certainly find out and report back. Awesome, thank you. I have a question. Um, so if the town decides to go forward with an acquisition, um, one of the first concerns is kind of getting up to state levels. Um, so based on your research, what 
capital projects would you recommend the town look at immediately after a purchase? So what we recommended in the report was kind of a phased approach in that the uh, main or the transmission main from Cox District Road and along Route 4 could be moved along quicker and be ready for construction faster uh, than a tank project likely would. Uh, that's certainly dependent on the landowner involved. Um, certainly the type of tank, that sort of thing. But the recommendation essentially was the what, what's called phase 1A in the report uh, could be moved forward immediately, design could be begin. Once financing is secured, you could move forward with construction. So that is a project that I'll call it fast track for Vermont. Uh, could be fast tracked versus a tank project, which with a third party entity uh, tends to take a, a little bit longer, uh, especially with the tank site that I prefer uh, uh, for the water system. And would that phase, in your opinion, get the town up to the water level they need to be? So the phase 1A will help get towards that. It will not solve the problem in its entirety. Okay. The tank is necessary for the quote unquote clean bill of health related to the hydraulic condition. And would it make sense to just do a tank first or you think Cox 6 would have to go first just because it's quicker? I, I think it, as far as is showing movement towards addressing the deficiency, that would be the recommendation if we thought that we could combine that into one project and not have it be exorbitantly long from a scheduling standpoint. It would it would be better to combine both as one project. You will get more bang for your buck. Uh, you will get bigger contractors who are willing to look at the job as opposed to it being split into two projects. Um, plus, you'll have less technical services related to one larger project than two separate projects. Thank you. Uh, moderator's prerogative. But uh, if time were not an issue, which would you do first? If time were not an issue, I would do the tank first. All right, other questions? Do we have any questions online or? Um, well, I don't know if the board has any financial questions or anything else or just. Uh, okay. um, can, I, can I ask one for Sam? Sam, are you still with us? I am. Excellent. Uh, so Tim, you kind of talked about that um, the aqueduct just kind of didn't have any cash flow or any reserves. Um, is it your belief that if the town owned it, uh, they'd be able to kind of run it more effectively financially, potentially, and then build up those reserves and have more capital reserves to kind of better align with uh, long-term needs? There's a potential for that, um, but I think under current state, under the current rates, um, you'd probably see some synergies on like administrative function and oversight versus like kind of the the forecasted expense structure, hiring in a new professional manager and, and the such. Um, but again, you're going to have to pay people more to kind of take on more responsibility or hire additional people. So I think current state, if you if the town just took it over, I don't know if there's a significant cost savings to run it as it is now by the town. I think that the cost savings piece comes into access to capital at cheaper rates for these bigger projects that are coming down the pike. Um, as it stands now, I mean, ultimately the town would still need to have enough funding to kind of handle normal course of operations, right? Whereas over the last two years, for instance, 22 had 460,000 of revenue, 23 was about 450,000, but in both years, 22 had $481,000 of expense, 23 had $544,000 of expense on kind of that normalized cost structure. So we're already at like a net, at a deficit, and that's before debt service. Um, so, I mean, regardless of who owns it, more money needs to somehow come in to kind of fund. Um, uh, that's a helpful answer, or if that addressed yeah, the question. If, if I could paraphrase you, uh, rates have to go up one way or the other. Correct. Okay, thank you. I think you, you're standing. I just this? wanted to add one one um, addition to your to your question, Eric. Is 
also to uh, the public service board has restrictions on how much capital reserve can be kind of hoarded for those purposes, uh, mainly because they're dealing with uh, GMP and electric and uh, telephone and that sort of thing. So the town will have more flexibility and less restriction related to how they capitalize what they're doing versus what the aqueduct has available to them. As an example, the aqueduct is paying right now to go through a rate increase to be able to get approval for a rate increase. If the town were in control of that, that process does not exist. There is no one telling you that you can't charge the rate that you've determined or whatever you guys want to do with the water system. So just, just a point of clarification or addition to that. Great, thank you. Now we have questions. Yes, remember if you can repeat your name, that would be wonderful. And oh, I'm sorry. If you could speak, at, yeah. Oh, I don't need one. Um, I'm Susie Stalls in Woodstock. So, um, totally get it that you say you need. We need to have a um, an aqueduct as a potential source, but we have three aqueducts. You said. So, can we sell one of them? Reservoir. Reservoir sorry. Yeah. Uh, can we sell one of them and use to a developer get some money to pay off some of this debt? So I speak to that because I don't know the specifics of the reservoir. My my all of this is related to the water system. Looking at the reservoirs, not part of. So I can't answer your question succinctly or correctly because I don't have specifics to the various sides. I'm Eric. Uh, so I was one. General manager for 33 years of the aqueduct company. Um, we sold no oh, reservoir, it's no longer. And, and we don't. So it's it's on the other side of the uh, of Route 4. And um, it did not go through the filter plant. And it's at a higher elevation, so we needed pressure reducers on it. So, so it became more of a liability than an asset. So what we did is we traded that, the sale of that property. For the Atwood property, which we drilled another well at. Yeah. Correct, correct. And the Bondell is connected to the Cox. So it's basically two in, in series. So the Cox reservoir is where the piping actually goes to. That's a 6 million gallon reservoir. The Bondell up the road is a 24 million gallon reservoir, and it connects back to the Cox by ways of a stream. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Cool. All right. So so sure. Sometimes people kind of line up. Yeah. Oh, that'd be yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If people with questions line up behind the podium, that's a good idea. Yeah, that is I know one line yet. Is there a microphone? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. Great. And just to remember, uh, comments for three minutes if possible, and then moving it on to other people so that we can hear from as many people as possible. So. Um, I'm Jill Davis. I live in the village. So I. I don't know who this question is directed at, but I understand that the current conditions of the system mean that no housing permits are being given. And I wonder what the timing is. How, what do we have to do to be able to uh, start re giving housing permits again? Do you, you want to have Willie answer that question? Willie can start. The, uh, uh, Mr. Nickerson, do you have an answer to that question? Did you hear it? I heard the uh, question, what needs to be done in order to uh, allow new connections to the water system? Yes. And the second part of it is, and how long will that take? I do not know the answer to that question off the top of my head. Um, I could take a few minutes and look in my records and see if there's an answer that I can find. Um, and then I'll uh, I'll raise my hand if I do, once I've done that, or yes, we could see if Craig knows. I'll, I'll answer the, the second question first. Uh, Timing-wise, uh, you're looking at multiple years from when authorization to move forward with these improvements start. So uh, essentially designing those, getting that all approved by the state of Vermont, and putting in funding applications and the such. So typically from design to finished construction, it's two to three years at a minimum. So it's two to three years before any housing can be allowed in this town. I do not know that answer definitively. And the reason that Willie is is not, the reason that Willie 
doesn't know the answer to that question is because we did come up with an interim policy related to the hydraulic condition. So when the fire department uses a hydrant, they have to communicate with the aqueduct. And if it's a hydrant of specific concern and the fire department is very aware of which hydrants those are and, and where they're located, we treat it like a water main break. And we put the system or portions of the system in a do not drink and allow them to test out to say there's no contamination issue. Now, I could make an argument that that means that we are adequately protecting the public and making new connections so long as they don't necessarily necessarily increase fire flow conditions, which I don't think they would unless it was something substantial, um, could be done under certain circumstances. So I know there's been talk about a, a moratorium about connections. I don't know that that is actually hard and fast what the water supply division has actually said. So I guess, Willie, I'll put that back to you and to say, if there's a moratorium, I'm not exactly 100% uh, that that's the case. Um, I don't believe that you guys have put a moratorium on connections, um, but I, I could be wrong. Wonder if uh, Willie Bennett, uh, did, do you want to get back to us when you have a moment? Yeah, I'll uh, right. I'll raise my hand if I when I okay. see if I can find an answer. So I'm going to leave the question then, and please could we have an answer? Is there a moratorium on new houses being connected to the water system? And if there is, how long, how much money do we have to spend and how long will it take to uh, get rid of that moratorium? Thank you. Come on up to Hi, I'm Roger Logan. I live in Woodstock Village. Um, I have a couple of questions. I'll ask them both at once and you can, whomever feels competent to answer. Um, is there, since since the, the kind of biggest identified hydraulic issue, I think you called it, um, is the sudden surge of use with a fire hydrant, is there any way to segregate the potable water system from the fire hydrant system that's not overly cost burdensome? No. Okay. All right. All right. Well, that's easy. <laughs> I mean, being a nerd, I might want to know the ad that explain, I, don't I explain said, it. But no, you don't want to do it. Um, um, the other question is, I don't know who can answer this, um, but when you're talking about three different sites for tanks and you've specked out what would be the ideal sites, has anybody done any kind of guesstimates as to what the cost of acquiring that land would be? So we haven't looked at land cost. What we, what we did was we took um, the, the sites and estimated a type of tank. Um, what Willie was mentioning earlier is that may not necessarily be the best type of tank for that given location. So of the four tank sites that we're looking at uh, in kind of descending order, um, the primary site would be right in right at Billings Farm uh, in the National Forest, right along the carriage trails off to the side. That would be the ideal spot for a tank because it would be before majority of the demand of the system. So we get back to what we were saying before, wells, tank, demand. That gets you the most bang for your buck because you get that water in front of all your demand. The other, there is one other option closer to the wells that would also have a similar impact to the water system being able to put the, the storage in front of the demand, um, but that site and the access to that site in my just reviewing it and looking at it is, is not as ideal uh, and certainly would be more costly. And then there are two other tank sites, uh, one of which I, it works on paper. I don't see how it would ever actually work in reality, but it, it, it is an option. So so just to follow up then, I, I know you have probably some idea of how much actually constructing the tanks and the infrastructure, but we haven't looked at all at the cost of acquiring the land. Right. Correct, because okay. that's a specific negotiation if a landowner is interested. So okay, what we've course. said to the aqueduct is, Go have conversations with these landowners and see who is interested because if they're not interested then it just gets eliminated as an option and start working towards that end towards what you're talking about yes okay great thank you i'm gonna carry you online yeah carry before we move on to our next uh question in the audience we have uh 
Carrie Cole. Carrie, go ahead with your question. Carrie Cole, Select Board. I live in the village of Woodstock. I'm just asking this so that it will be asked. Theoretically, could one just pull all the hydrants and rely on um, fire truck tanks and move that to the bottom of the priority list? So um, I'll take this in, in two parts. Um, if if the aqueduct wanted to eliminate the deficiency in the quickest manner possible with the least amount of capital involved, they could pull all the hydrants. Um, politically and life safety wise, that's a completely different conversation. So to answer your question on the financial side, yes, they could. That would be the cheapest way to address the deficiency that the water system currently has. Um, I'm not recommending that option. I don't think you'll find too many people who would. That being said, a private entity who buys the aqueduct and comes in would not be restricted from doing so. So that is something to keep in mind related to this, this conversation. Um, it will solve the problem. It will be the cheapest way to do it, and it will not be in the best interest of the village and the town, in my opinion, if that were to occur. Thank you. I just wanted to get that out there. <laughs> yep. Before we move on, uh, the, the Woodstock Aqueduct Company has stated several times that in its formation, it was for the general service of the community. So they would not, as their board and their shareholders, move to do that because that's not the purpose of their establishment. So. Hi, uh, Wendy Marinin, village resident. Uh, my question, uh, is based on an anecdotal experience, personal anecdotal experience related to fire hydrants and safety and tanks. Um, a week ago yesterday, I went to use my main water in the kitchen and it was running uh, a little spluttery and brown. And I was about to entertain, so I was a little distressed. Um, I called the water company and got a person right off, which was brilliant. And she uh, got back to me as soon as she could and um, spoke to a water technician. The fire company had contacted them and was filling their tank. So what was happening in my house had everything to do with the fire trucks being filled. There was no advance warning or, hey, heads up, this is going to be happening. I'm not sure how this experience translates across the community. Um, it took about two to three hours to run clear. The solution, the answer to me was it's not contaminated and just keep running your water. And I said, well, that's thank you, but okay. And then you have your water bill. But it's just an anecdote I want to share that's relevant to our current situation and how might the real, the question is, how does that compute in what your findings that 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 filling tank story, I guess, is what it is. Thanks. So the the situation that you're describing, I would say, would be similar to flushing hydrants. So seasonally, hydrants will get flushed. Typically, you get a notice, hey, you guys are going to see some discolored water. And that's really because they're trying to move any sediment that's sitting into the pipes to get that through. It's actually trying to clean what might be sitting for sediment in the pipes. It, it's trying to flush whatever's sitting in the pipes. When they go to tie onto the water system to fill up trucks, it's a very similar thing. You're getting a high demand, you're getting high velocity through that water. It's stirring up what's sitting at the bottom when it's not as turbulent. So I, I think, Anecdotally, I understand what you're saying. They're not the same situation as far as if a fire were to occur, you will probably see that condition in the surrounding areas for a day or so because that water had been moved through there. So in that, that way, it is similar. Um, in general, that happens on every municipal water system. Every time they flush, they have to send out notices of discolored water because they are stirring up what's sitting at the bottom of the pipes. So this is typical of most municipal water systems uh, that I have experience with. Okay, but the, the point being, I'm not sure how often tanks need to get filled. 
Um, but that wasn't a notice. That wasn't a, hey, we're going to do this kind of situation. Sure. A and if the comment is that if the fire department or somebody else is going to fill a water truck, because sometimes there will be contractors who come to the aqueduct and ask to have a water truck filled up for a construction. If, if the comment is, hey, that might be a useful notification to us, or you know, maybe where you're pulling that water from isn't the greatest, I, I'm sure that's a conversation that could be had with the water system and getting some notice uh, of when they are selling water in that manner. So what I'm hearing is this is not a reflection of the current water company. This is normal. Correct. Thank yes. you. <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. Uh, Carrie, that was an old hand. Okay. We have next, come on up. Hello, uh, Amy McElroy, Woodstock Village. Um, two things. The first was um, because I provided this report that the Woodstock Aqueduct sent us last week about the PFAS contaminants, I just wanted to clarify. It says that um, the results here, they were the three they, they tested in like 2019, 2020, and 2023, um, that they only reported on five um, PFAS compounds because those are the only ones regulated, regulated by the Vermont State Water Supply. It says additional PFAS not regulated by the Vermont Water Supply rule may also have been detected in the past five years. Please contact us if you would like more information on other unregulated PFAS. So I'm just pointing that out um, for Laura's question. And then um, I also just wanted to comment um, I won't read it because it's a little long, but um, on my listserv entry um, that yes, I am in support of the rate increase. Um, I think we need to do it. Um, we need to get that pipe off the street now. And we really can't wait for all the negotiations that are going to um, happen um, between now and hopefully when we buy the water aqueduct, the aqueduct company. I'm very much in favor of purchasing it. Sounds like there's a lot of issues that we'll deal with coming up but um, so between the being able to get the hookups going as soon as possible for new construction and getting the pipe off the street, I'm in favor of the rate increase. Right. Welcome. All right, and the next speaker. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Matt Stout. I'm a resident of the town of Woodstock. I also own a property in the village that's served by the aqueduct company. Um, I'm a sc school board member, um, I'm a vice president of a large electric utility, uh, and I also founded and am currently the president of the Woodstock Area Mountain Bike Association. So I, I have some information I'd just like to provide to the public and the select board uh, with respect to uh, the Woodstock Aqueduct Company's contribution to, to public recreation in our community. Um, so just quickly, our organization uh, has built and maintains 30 miles of trails in the Woodstock area. Um, those are all open for the public for multi-use recreation. Our, our main landowners are the town, the Woodstock Inn, and the Woodstock Aqueduct Company. Um, we have worked over the years with Frank Billings, uh, with Jaira, and with, with Eric. And I just want to thank them for, for how generous they've been. Um, we worked with Craig Jewett on an Act 250 permit to put in place 12 miles of trails at, at the Aqueduct Company. Um, I'd, I'd like to just let the public know from my research, uh, the Billings family has allowed the Vondell Reservoir in West Woodstock and the 383 acres that surround it to be used for traditional Vermont uh, uses, including hunting, fishing. It's the only trout stocked pond or a reservoir in the town of Woodstock. Otherwise, you're, you've got a fish yacht, a Quiche, good luck. Um, it has a, a snowmobile trail uh, that's maintained by the VAST uh, system. It has two class four roads that bisect it that are used avidly by jeeping community. Uh, there's not a day uh, that I don't see someone up there using that land. I, I live on Cox District Road. Uh, there are birders, there are folks foraging for mushrooms, uh, spring ephemerals, they're all there right now. Um, our organization built a parking lot so the public could use it. Uh, it's used uh, very often by folks who enjoy outdoor recreation. Hikers, trail runners, cross-country skiers, uh, snowshoers, uh, those of us who enjoy mountain biking. 
Uh, the high school horticulture program has put trees in place. They have their cross country running team uses it, the cycling team uses it. Uh, and I can't forget to mention the dog walkers. If you know anyone who owns a dog in town, this is their favorite place to go. Uh, and they're there every day. I go 30 seconds. Okay. Um, so quickly on ecological value is a state significant wetlands, state significant vernal pool with endangered species. It's got endangered plant species. It's got a connected block of land up to, to Mount Tom, Mount Peg. Uh, Mount Tom, Mount Peg do not allow any of those traditional uses I just discussed. So it's very unique in what it provides for Woodstock. So our our position uh, you just is, yeah, our position is we'd like to see that land protected with an easement and, and the Woodstock Africa Aqueduct Company is willing uh, to do that. We'd like to see town ownership with an easement that allows for continued use of the land by the public. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Okay, nothing here. Bono. Um, hello, my name is Seth Westbrook. I'm a Pomfret resident, um, co-founder of the Woodstock Area Mountain Bike Association. Uh, so I'll, Matt said most the questions for the aqueduct, but this is more to do with purchasing and, and, and what's been going on. I don't think, unless you have a question. I don't have a question. I, I'm just in support of, get, of, of the process. Later. Let's get the questions out of the way. Yep. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Mark McElroy, village resident. Um, I have a question about the scope of the assessment. Is it Otter Creek? Is it, it was, I, I changed employment at the end of the year. Okay, well, um, Craig was, was very clear about what the scope of his assessment was, what he was asked to do relative to the current deficient condition having to do with fire hydrants. But my question is, what about the rest of the analysis that presumably uh, should come into play during the course of due diligence in a situation like this? What about the things that fell outside of your scope having to do with the, um, you know, assessing uh, the state of the, the system, the infrastructure um, in ways that could help to indicate what sort of other potential deficient conditions might come up in the future. Um, I very much support the idea of acquiring uh, Woodstock Aqueduct, but I'd like to see the whole picture, not just part of it. And I'm curious to know if the select board made a decision not to look at that or how will this broader assessment um, be be done if in fact it's it's no it's it's on deck to Are occur like that or i don't when you say broader assessment what do you I, I let me jump in for a minute i think you're saying there are those things that we know that what Craig has told us is increasing the hydrologic pressure at the fire hydrants and then how to do it. But there are a lot of things that we don't know. So for instance, we know what the age of the pipes is underneath. Mm -hmm. We don't know the condition of every foot of those pipes. Mm -hmm. And how do you conduct that analysis? I'm not sure. So to, to answer the question, uh, what, what you're asking about is what we would call an asset management plan. So it's an inventorying of the water system from source to uh, services and an evaluation and a development of a capital improvement plan. What, what needs to be done over the next 20 years? Um, we did talk about that with the aqueduct when we first got into the PER. Um, they did not want to bite off more than they could chew. And again, from a financing standpoint, if the town own the water system, there's a $50,000 grant to do an asset management plan. If Gyro wanted to do it or the aqueduct wanted to do it, that's all out of pocket for them. So it becomes that sort of push pull related to that. They wanted to not give the impression that they were trying to take on too much so that they didn't address the initial concern, because this is the initial concern. You're 100% right. There are pipes that are over 100 years old that need to be assessed as to when they need to be replaced, not if, when. 
Um, that's just not what this report was developed for. I understand what you're saying and wanting to have that done. Um, that has been part of a negotiation in other scenarios that I've seen, and there is financing available, including the purchasing of the water system. That can actually be financed through the same uh, federal funding programs that the town has access so to. Those are things we wouldn't be in a position to know until after the acquisition. Is that what you're I, I would say at this point, if, if the decision is going to be made, it, it would take typically a year to a year and a half to develop a, an asset management plan that gives you the information at that level that you're looking for. Yes. Okay. Uh, so before I move on, Willie, yeah. Uh, Mr. Nickerson, you have your hand up. Terrific. Yes. Well, I don't know if my answer is going to be satisfactory, but I have found uh, two references in our files that the um, water system has been told that it is not permitted to expand because it needs to demonstrate adequate hydraulic capacity. Um, both are from before the PER was approved and neither say specifically uh, what the consideration for um, requiring that, that restriction are. Um, so I can only speculate as to the, the specific reason, but it is clearly related to the hydraulic capacity of the system, which is the deficiencies associated with the fire hydrants. Um, and typ typically when we have fire hydrants in a water system that um, depressurize the system when they're used, we require those hydrants to be converted to a flushing hydrant or removed from the system. And I and the, in this case, it, um, all but one hydrant in the system, so my note, the notes I'm looking at say 95 of the hydrants are deficient. So removing them or taking them offline um, may not be feasible. And that that's probably likely the reason for the, for the restriction on additional connections. Um, but I have not yet found when the, the, the letter uh, where that was communicated to the water system. So I'll have to do additional digging to get the complete answer on that question. That would be very helpful. So we have one last question. Graham, you're going to be the last question asked tonight. Fantastic. Congratulations. Please state your name. I'm Graham Hankey. My wife and I live in Woodstock Village. I'm an Aqueduct customer, and uh, I support acquisition of the company by the town. Um, I support rolling uh, control of that acreage around the reservoir by the town. I think that's a silver lining in this otherwise difficult situation. Um, my concern, I guess, as I look out is, and this was a bullet on your second slide, I think, the town's capacity to manage this going forward if the transaction is successful. And you know, I think the town has struggled with managing infrastructure for quite a long time. I think the, the current government, the current board is doing well. Uh, but that's that's going to be a Herculean task to maximize the benefit of public control. And uh, so I would, my question is, what are your thoughts on that? And ha has have you all been doing some thinking on how you can buttress it? Uh yeah, in this process, we talked to a few other towns who purchased prior, prior water companies, and what we found by most of them was they were able to wrap in the water system into the sewer system with the same staff. Uh, most recent, they had a staff of three in the sewer, and they bought a water company and moved it in. We have a staff of three. We've talked to them. They're comfortable with that process. Um, legally, if we were to acquire that uh, aqueduct company, we need someone with a water license. Uh, you cannot get that until you work on the water for a year. So at bare minimum, we have to take on some aqueduct staff for the first year as our guys got training on licensed. One suggestion I would leave you with, uh, considering a volunteer board of directors or some other entity that could provide help on the strategic long-term side, maybe also the pursuit of grants and public funds. Uh, again, that I think it's going to be tough to really leverage that benefit that public ownership creates. And there's a lot of talent in town here that probably would be willing to step up and uh, participate in something like that. 
on behalf of the select board, I'd like to thank you for volunteering. Okay. Um, with that, I think we're wrapping up that yeah. portion. Yeah. Yeah. So if I could just finish, I, I know a lot of people came here tonight. Um, first, of all, I want to thank Charlie, um, Craig, Tim, Willie for helping us out tonight. We really appreciate it. Everyone that showed up. Uh, I know some people probably wanted to speak more, had more questions, wanted to speak for or against this. Um, the select board will be discussing this at their meeting on May 21st, uh, and it will be an ongoing discussion on their agenda uh, until they make a decision uh, whether to go forward with this or not. So we welcome your comments in those meetings. Uh, you can also reach out to myself or any select board member via email uh, to express uh, your feelings on it as we go forward. That being well, I do have a question. Uh, was in the restroom. <laughs> Anyone? Do you recognize this phone? Anyone? I mean, I so, so oh, okay. uh, I like a motion to adjourn. Yeah, so moved. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 You're welcome. Come out. Thank you.